Welcome to the Speak With People podcast. My name is Jason Rates. I'll be your host, and this podcast exists to help you improve your communication skills. Whether you communicate one-on-one, to a team, from a stage, or from behind a screen, we know that when we improve our communication skills as leaders, it exponentially changes everything. It improves our relationships, it improves our leadership skills, and it improves our business skills. So let's get ready to dive into this next episode. What are some of the biggest communication traps that leaders face today? Are they different for executive leaders? Are they amplified for executive leaders because of some additional responsibility? Does it matter at what level in the organization they are? What are the different communication traps that leaders kind of fall into? And what can they do to avoid those traps so they can succeed with their communication? I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time. Today, I sit down with an incredible leader who's been helping and guiding executive leaders leaders for years. Uh, She helps executives find clarity and convey complex ideas with less hassle and work. There's just nothing better than finding clarity. And so I'm so excited to welcome Devina Stanley to the podcast. Welcome to the Speak With People podcast. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, I can't wait to dive into our conversation and I'm looking forward to it because especially as someone who loves communication, like many of our listeners love communication a lack of clarity in our communication can really uh, mess up a lot of good things. Before we get to that, though, I'd love to just have you share a little bit more of your story with our listeners so they can you know, get to know you and find out you know, where you're from, who you are, and what you do, and all those good kind of things. Mm-hmm. No, wonderful. So I grew up on a potato farm in southeast and South Australia. Actually, I tell a lie. I went to school in southeast South Australia, but <laughs> in, in Victoria, I crossed the border with my illegal fruit every day to school. Um, wow. Yeah, I know. Decadent, like just wrong. Um, <laughs> but we lived, some people might have heard of a fairly famous Australian winemaking area. So we lived quite close to a place called Kunawara. Mm. And so I grew up there growing up on a farm. You think anything's possible, but possibly have no idea really what that is. And so I've had this fabulous adventure doing all sorts of things. I went to Adelaide for university. I studied to be a primary school teacher. I moved to Melbourne. I got married really young to somebody who had this travel bug. And so we headed off to Hong Kong and New York and Tokyo back to Melbourne and Sydney. And then uh, now we're living in Seattle and we're staying. We're not planning to do any more driving tests. We really like it here. So we're planning to stay. So um, that gives you, I guess, the quick story. Uh, On a work front, I started as a kindergarten teacher. I moved into corporate communication very quickly and then joined McKinsey in Hong Kong as a communication specialist and have specialized in a discipline called the Pyramid Principle. Um, and was fortunate enough to be evaluated by a woman called Barbara Minto um, to teach it a long time ago. So I've focused everything I do around that one technique and making um, making it so much easier for people to use synthesis and logic to clarify and convey complex ideas. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's just fascinating. Let's back up to your story for a second because I'm sure growing up on a farm, was a, a fascinating deal. I, I grew up in the city of Detroit. It wasn't until I was in my mid thirties that we moved to an area where we were around lots of farmland. And I, for the first time in my life, learned so much from farmers about growth and yeah. patience. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it was amazing. I'm sure you, uh, as I, maybe it's just because some of the movies and TV I watched, I'm imagining some of the animals or uh, insects that probably you guys faced on that oh, farm. You want the Australian story? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here you go. <laughs> so we we had sheep and some cattle. You know, in terms of the animals that we we grew, if you like. But we had other visiting animals, and so we we did have kangaroos occasionally or wallabies, which are a different. <laughs> kind but small kangaroo in fact um we had another very old property a uh, home on our property that we used to rent out and those people had a pet kangaroo <laughs> which was pretty cool and uh we also had a lot of snakes and they were oh, a wow. kind of snake oh yes yeah people <laughs> here in the states always ask me is it 
safe to go to Australia because of the spiders, <laughs> because of the snakes. Yes. Well, yes, but you've got to know what you're doing, I suppose. And my uh, the family that lived in that house, one of the things that the father, his name was Noel, used to do was to help us. He would lay out sheets of corrugated iron, you know, that sort of mm-hmm. tin that's like this. So it gets very warm. And so snakes love the warmth. And because you've got the corrugations, they'd slither in underneath, right? And so what he used to do was have a very long piece of wire and another very long, very plaited piece of wire that was very strong. And he would lift it and kill them because we had so many, it was actually a problem. I can tell you all sorts of stories of, you know, particularly my, my brother, you know, riding into the garage on his motorbike as a teenager and going to put his foot down, you know, when he put the stand down and discovering that his foot would have landed in the center of a coil. Oh, all right. So, and then when he was a baby, I'll give you one more. I could give you others, but I'll just give you this one. He was a baby. Oh, he was in nappies. He was one and a half diapers, you know, and we had a place, I think that garage was actually a problem. So we uh, were washing the car, you know, for a little kid that's fun, soap and water and things. I was a lot older than him. I was a teenager. And all of a sudden along came one with his head up like this. And these are, these snakes, the tiger snake has the most poisonous venom of any snake, as I understand it. They have a really faulty mechanism for biting but they're still very, very dangerous. If they had good teeth, like effective teeth, not good teeth, effective teeth, then they would be, you know, absolutely, you know, up there. But my mother came and dealt with it, with the rake that was by the back door, you know. But, you know, I've got so many memories of those, you know. So you've opened a Pandora's box. Yes. (laughs) We we had some other lovely animals too. I bet. I bet. You know, and um, where I live here in Seattle, we have bunny rabbits. We had lots of rabbits, <laughs> you know, and they were a bit of a problem too because they messed up the crops. But, um, you know, they're much more, you know, sweeter sort of animal, I suppose. Um, we didn't have some of the other Australian specialties like wombats or echidnas on our farm. We had some beautiful bird life, ibises mm. and so on. But, um, yeah, the snakes, I think, have caused the most visceral response for me <laughs> in terms of the wildlife that I grew yes. up with. Hmm. Yes. It's uh we get the same. We moved from uh, Michigan to Florida and our, our Michigander friends are like, are there alligators everywhere? Are there snakes? And yes. And when we moved, we thought, nah, there's, there's not alligators. And when we got here, someone said, everybody water, there's an alligator. And Yep, there's alligators. <laughs> oh, and you wouldn't have much. I mean, obviously, you'd, you'd have deer and moose and maybe other bears and so on in Michigan because right. you have cold weather animals. But do you actually get snakes? Uh, tiny little snakes, gardener snakes, you know, nothing nothing of any substance in Michigan. So, yeah, we right. the deer and the elk and, you know, the squirrels and, you know, all of those different kind of things. So, uh yeah, that's kind of what we uh, we dealt with there. So here now we walk out into our gr- uh, garage and there's lizards that run everywhere. And so, you know, mm. you get used to the different, uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. different things. Yeah. No, you well, do. You do. Well, I'm fascinated to listen to your story. So uh, how did you go from kindergarten teacher to, you know, communication specialist? Like I love I love that <laughs> jump. What you know, what did what kind of spurred that on? Well, I think a couple of things. Firstly, when I was at Teachers College, I learned from an Australian author and she's written these most magnificent children's books. Her name's Mem Fox and she's there are two that I love the best, one called Possum Magic and one called Wilfred Gordon MacDonald Partridge, which is about a little boy who helps his grandmother find her memory. So they're beautiful books. And Mem grew up as a missionary in Africa and she brought this beautiful sense of rhythm and cadence to her stories. And so I was very, very fortunate to learn to write from her when I was actually at Teachers College. And it was my writing that got me a job as a teacher. And I was actually the only person in my year at at Teachers College to get a full-time permanent position Mm. the year of graduating. So that 
writing was actually what got me that role. Oh, wow. And so the teaching thing didn't work out for reasons that are a bit dull, but I ended up moving into corporate communication and I did it through a back door. The economy was terrible in Australia and I just wanted a permanent position so I didn't have to go back to that farm. Like I didn't really mind Mm. what it was so long as I could do it and it would pay me reliably, I would, you know, do it. And so I ended up working in a corporate affairs department as a secretary and board and started helping in my leaders write their letters. Mm. The team looked after a corporate newsletter. And so I started writing for that. And my boss said to me, he said, you really should go back to school. You really need to go back. You're not going to be doing this secretary thing for that long. Go back to uni. And I went, oh, okay, well, what should I study? He said, well, if you like writing, have a look at public relations or you know journalism or something like that. So I did, I got in, I did that. And I mentioned this husband of mine who um, had the the wanderlust. He wanted to work in banking, so he wanted to live in Hong Kong. He just loved Hong Kong. And so we went there and I had a job with a PR firm when I went, which I didn't like at all. And he saw a job ad and he passed it over. It was in the South China Morning Post. He says, oh, here you go, have a look at this. And he'd initially seen McKinsey and thought, oh, that'd be good, I'd like that. And then he read the ad and said, oh no, that's for you. And so, you know, I took a look at it and I was like, oh, that, that sounds interesting. What's, what's management consulting? Who's mm. McKinsey? You know, I had no idea. And he, he explained, I thought, oh, that sounds really fun. So I applied and after a process, you know, I got the job, which was really cool and got to work with the most wonderful people wow. and such interesting people, particularly back in the, um, it was the late second half of the 90s that I was in Hong Kong with them. And, um, you know, we had dissidents, children, we had every kind of political um, child, you know, people who moved from France because their father was part of the Cypriot leadership when there was a coup and grew up in France and then, you know, joined McKinsey. Some, you know, people out of China, people who came from Cuba, all sorts of places. So Hong Kong's a very big melting pot of people from all over the world. Certainly it was, I think, more so back then. And so it was just such a fascinating time. And I had, you know, the really great privilege of working with the firm for three years on staff. Then I moved to New York, six months pregnant with a one-year-old. And so I thought, "Mm, maybe I won't continue with the full-time job, you know. Yeah. Um, But then freelanced for the firm for another 15 years, helping and coaching consultants to, you know, communicate clearly using the pyramid principle, using this structured way of organising your ideas. And, you know, such interesting stuff. You learn something every day. So fun. Wow, I love that. I, uh, my wife and I, we adopted a uh, our uh, our youngest son from China, and when we flew out of China, we f- we flew out of the Hong Kong airport, and mm-hmm. I was not ready for how big it is. You know, they in in oh, the, it's huge in the states. They yeah. say you know everything's bigger in Texas, but oh, you, no, no. you go to China, and <laughs> everything is really bigger in China. <laughs> can be, can be. And so when you're saying that you must have been through the new airport. Yes. Too. Yes. Yeah. We, yeah. yeah. And that's a wonderful airport. It's so schmick, you know, the old one though was so much more fun. Can I tell you? <laughs> it was right on the harbour and you know, the buildings in Hong Kong, it's full of really tall, tall right. buildings and mountains and the sort of the middle of Hong Kong, you've got the, the water, but you're going up to mountains on the side. It was actually one of the most difficult um, major airstrips to land in. And so the pilots had to fly manually. They couldn't do it on auto. And so they fly to the checkerboard wow. and turn and in between the buildings and down. Oh. <laughs> it was cool. It was really fun. <laughs> wow. wow. On a good day, it was fun. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> on a bad day, it was scary. <laughs> yes, I love it. Okay, so for our listeners who you know, haven't been through the pyramid principle, would you give us just kind of an overview and uh, you've kind of wet our whistle a little bit uh, Mm. talking about it a few times and I love it. Would love to be able to give this type of uh, learning to our our listening community. Mm. Look, the simplest way to describe it is that you're encouraged to have a really short introduction, super short, 
and then one main message, which is 25 words or less. And then you structure the supporting ideas using logic and logic combined with synthesis. Mm. So logic in the sense that we um, make sure that things are really well ordered horizontally and vertically. You have one idea at a time, order them very logically in both directions. It becomes like a tree. We work visually in a tree. Um, and, you know, in sometimes using separate ideas, sometimes using chained ideas to form a deductive structure. And it, it's like an insight engine. It's like mm. a machine, a thinking machine, if you understand how it works. And wow. so I guess what I've done is I've used it for so long that I've come to see patterns in the shapes of the stories. And so I've written two new books, one of them for leaders and one of them for team members, because it strikes me that when you're preparing significant communication, um, it's it's all very well to know how to structure it, you know, short mm. introduction, one main message, supporting points, organised logically, that's fine. But actually what matters is what goes into those structures. Right. And a story can be as beautifully structured as you like, but if it says the wrong thing, it's absolutely useless. Ooh, and wow. so if you, and this, so this becomes a collaborative effort. And what I see happening too much is quite a dysfunctional operating rhythm around them where yeah. we have, you know, senior people late at night rewriting their team's papers, you know, papers, presentations, reports, anything. And sometimes email too, like important ones, not just everyday ones, but yep. big ones. And what tends to happen is somebody asks, you know, the leader asks their team to do something and they, they do it and they send it back for review. And the leader opens it and goes, Whew, there's a lot of great stuff here. And I need to do this justice. I can't just quickly tick and flick because I need to read it. I need to be thoughtful. I need to do the thing. And so what they do is they flag it and they come back to it later when it becomes urgent. And it's really hard to find that time during a normal day. And so it ends up being close to when it's due. So often, you know, the person who's written it has done it on time. They've been early even, and they sit there and they wait while this thing lingers in their leader's inbox. Yep. And so very close to the day when the paper's due, the leader thinks, oh gosh, this really matters now. Nine o'clock at night or Sunday afternoon, they open up their email and they go, right, now I'm gonna get into it. And because they've left it so late, they have no option to send right. it back, right? right? Or if they do, if they do get to it early, they do it in track changes and they leave mm. these little minute comments. Oh, that looks a bit like jargon or maybe move that idea a bit further up and really sort of convoluted. Oh, no, 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 not that message, but really minute sorts of comments. And you end up in this death spiral of edits by chain of pain, as I call it, mm. or the leader redoes it. Right. Both of those things is poor it, and completely unnecessary. So, you know, setting up the team to know what they're communicating about and why early on means that they then have a chance of putting the right things into that structure so that right. the structure is actually useful. You wow. Know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think uh, some of those executive leaders who are, uh, waiting to the last second, making those changes, kind of surprising their team members, you know, mm -hmm. with, you know, all of this work kind of at the last second. Do you think they're, they're doing it out of pure, their load is just too heavy? Do you think, you know, maybe some of their staff members, they just don't have the trust yet with them, you know, to let them kind of fly on their own? You know, what do you think, you know, some of the, because I was even thinking about some of the things, you know, as, as I'm working with my team, I'm going, okay, yeah, why did I, you know, boy, time's my friend. How come I didn't give us uh -huh. more time, you know, to work on yeah. this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, I think sometimes people just don't know an alternative way mm, yeah. and they don't know how to get out of the detail and they don't know how to have to send something to their manager or for their manager to ask for a specific kind of a thing that is really easy to access the ideas right? The main idea is often buried. We joke in my team that it's on the bottom of page 47, you know, and because they actually haven't got a good sense of 
why something's needed and what it needs to achieve, they just throw everything at it because then it's really hard to be wrong. Mm. And when you don't actually know what you're shooting for, it's really hard to crystallize your message. And so I just think people don't know how to synthesize onto a page. They don't know. Um, it, it just doesn't, it hasn't occurred to them, yeah. you know, it's possible to work top down rather than doing what one of my clients said to me, said, now, the reason I want you to help me and my people is that you're telling me we don't need to do 16 rounds of reviews on a 10 page paper. We don't need to do that. I'm saying, no, no, you don't, you know, you can get up out of the weeds and have some really great conversations at a point in the cycle, we've got time to have them rather than, you know, nine, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Wow. Yes. The night before you've got to submit it to your CEO so he can review it for the board. And so I've, I've segued a little bit off your question there, which was, you know, why, why do leaders do it? Yes. Partly, partly because I think they just don't have another way. But partly also because the leaders haven't thought hard enough at the very beginning mm. as to what really needs to happen. Yeah. And so they don't brief their team because they haven't thought about it. So the team needs to be empowered to ask some really good questions of the leader so that the leader can get everyone ready and head off. Absolutely. So thinking's hard and it takes time and it has to happen I think collaboratively in this kind of setting, because it's normal, it's normal for there to be yeah. you know, collaboration. It's just, how do you do it right. in such a way that means that you can create some margin in your life at work and also at home, frankly, you know, I think yep. most people at nine o'clock at night would rather do something else <laughs> other than rewrite their team's presentation. You know? Yes. Yes. Where, yeah. do you, where do you think some of the breakdown comes with that? Because uh, clarity is, you know, it, it is the clarity issue in, in most forms of communication has been around for a while. So is it a breakdown hmm. with what leaders are learning in college? Is it a breakdown with, you know, the communication with, you know, uh, team leadership? Is it a breakdown with, you know, just people not having those skills, even that you laid out in the pyramid? pyramid principle, you know, to be able to, to be able to get that clarity, you know, to be able to communicate that message. Where do you think that breakdown comes from? I think it comes from time. Mm. I think people are so busy so doing yes. that they don't step back to think. So I think that, well, my understanding is that those leaders that have the greatest amount of margin thinking time, are the ones that actually do the best. Yes. So freeing themselves up to think early means they've got to be, they've got to have the operations humming. Yes. They've got to assume that it's not normal for them to take 500 pages home every weekend to rewrite, which I'm told many do. I've had clients say to me, well, that's just my job. You know, I'm senior, I'm paid a lot, right? So of course I have to go and, and rework all of this or review all of this. Um, So I think there's an assumption that it's normal, which I challenge. I don't think it has to be. And, yeah, it's about taking control of their diaries and their time and also actually letting go of their old job, right? Because when you get promoted, it can be a little bit scary. So when you are accustomed to being, let's say, a team leader and you get moved up to being a leader of teams, plural, you know, you've got to move much more into a strategic rather than operational way of being. You have to. And that shift is hard because you're familiar with what's happening down here. You know, it's much more management and, okay, this is what we've got to do. And so how do we optimise the heck out of that to get it done? Okay, you know, I'm comfortable with that. But then you come up to being perhaps more strategic and much more interested in why things have got to be done and what are the right things to do at a much broader level. And it's like, well, I'm actually, I don't know if I've admitted this to myself, but I'm more comfortable at that level down there because I haven't worked out really what's required up here. So it's actually much more comfortable for me to still operate here and I don't even realise I'm doing it. I don't realise that I'm disempowering 
my new team manager, who's also stepped up, everybody's operating at a level below where they should be. <sighs> That's so good. Before, yes. In fact, below what they're paid to be. And so yeah, I think there's a whole lot of practical reasons for it that are just human. You know, it's quite natural to feel, okay, how do I actually step up to this new level? How do yep. I let go of that thing? Yep. How do I trust that person to do that thing or those people to do that thing? Yep. But also, you know, how do you find the time to get your head straight so you can brief them really well Yep. so that they can write the right thing, you know? Yep, absolutely. You've got to have some margin. Mm. Oh, that's, oh, that's so timely. We've talked about that before on the podcast, especially with, you know, middle managers who are now making that struggle with just what you mm -hmm. talked about. And that's so, that's so good. Uh, your book, The So What Strategy, you know, mm -hmm. as you kind of walk that down, I love, I love that concept because boy, it could really help leaders kind of, you know, uh, understand what's going on. Could you just walk us through kind mm -hmm. of the overview of that, of that book and that strategy mm -hmm. that for our leaders? What, I'm, what I might do, I'll talk about that briefly, but I'll segue to the two new ones and I'll, I'll explain why yeah. I've written two new ones. Yep. So um, the Sobit strategy is great for really simple stories that are at um, everyday simple communication. It's, it's very good for that. What I think is helpful when you get to the more complex stories is to have this operating rhythm in play. Mm. So to go beyond just yourself but to think about how do I collaborate? How do I work with my leaders? If we think of time and then you think of your leaders, their mind tracks along up here and then the team, their mind tracks along down here. You've sort of got two things happening in parallel. Yep. And if you can kickstart the thinking process early for both the leaders and the team, if you can kickstart that process early, you're able to take advantage of what's called diffuse thinking. So focused thinking is what we think of when we think of thinking, which is, okay, I'm doing the thing right now. Here am I, I'm pounding out my story, I'm working, I'm concentrating, I'm thinking really hard. But a lot of our really great ideas come to us when we're in the shower hmm. or when we're walking the dog. And so by kickstarting the thinking really early for both leader and team, then what you do is kickstart this opportunity for diffuse thinking also. So you get the benefit of how the brain works, right? So you get the benefit of the focus at times, but then also, okay, I'm going to go do something else now. And just, it just percolates and it's yep. not effortful. It happens when you sleep. So by kickstarting it early and organizing all of the thinking around a single highly structured page, the messaging, yeah. then you can get feedback really quickly. You can iterate around the messaging really quickly. Wow. And then once that's done, the PowerPoint's easy. The paper's right. easy. And, you, and frankly, you might not even need one. Yes. Right? Because it might end up being that actually now that my thinking is so clear and my manager agrees with my thinking, well, I can just go and have a conversation and get it done. I don't actually need a presentation. Yes. You know, yep. I can make a phone call. This happened yep. yesterday, actually, in a coaching session. I was working with a large uh, manuf or mining company, actually, mining services company. And somebody said, oh, so I shouldn't actually write an email about that. I should just call them up. In fact, an email might work against me. I was like, I think you're right. Absolutely, you're <laughs> right. Right. Because the story moved from, yes, okay, I need this person to provide me with the advice to, I need this person to prioritize giving me the advice. Wow. Very different story. Right. Yeah. Right. So please give me the advice on blah, blah, blah issue is very different than saying, Hey, Mary, I've been waiting three months for this. <laughs> I really need right. it. You know? Exactly. It's different. Yeah. Mm. Why, why do you think more, I mean, uh, I was recently reading through, uh, some recent uh, research, you know, 93% of business leaders agree that ineffective communication slows down productivity and morale. You know, I mean, all these numbers are out there uh, of what miscommunication, ineffective communication, you know, all these things actually do to a team, to a company, the revenue they lose, the, you know, the morale. Why do you think companies of, you know, kind of all shapes and sizes don't spend more time and energy in some learning and development, you know, related items or 
you know, getting some of these communication things straight, they just kind of keep barreling, hoping that everybody mm-hmm. will kind of figure it out as they go. Or maybe mm-hmm. I, I have the wrong approach there. Maybe companies are doing a great job, you know, with, you know, making sure everyone's on the same page. But I mm-hmm. wonder what your thoughts on that. Well, I think some are, but some are not. I think you're right. There's a mix. And I think it's hard because if you think what is communication, it's about engaging somebody else with what's in your mind. Mm. And if we think back to just being human, to do that, you've got to understand your audience, which in itself is such a basic idea, but one of the hardest things on the world to do, right? So building relationship requires you to understand the other person quite deeply. I actually think life in often, mostly if nothing else is about relationship. And so that is actually just really, really hard to do. And everybody comes to every communication setting as their own flawed self, you know, trying their very best, usually, if not, then they should find the door and find something else that they want to try hard at, right? But mostly people really do want to do the very best. And it is um, it's just hard. And I think too, the whole idea of communication, there's, it's quite vague. There's a lot of platitudes about what makes good communication. And until you really drill into what type of communication is this, mm. you know, what setting is this taking place in, what outcome do we want, then it, it just becomes very fluffy and loose, you know? Right, right, absolutely. Absolutely. What do you think? I mean, we're kind of in unprecedented times with uh, four generations working together now with Gen Z and millennials and Gen X and baby boomers, you know, and and then we're, you know, soon, you know, we'll have the generation alpha, you know, will overtake, you know, all of those with the the largest numbers that we'll see. But each of those generations communicate differently. Mm. And and, I mean, it's, it's just amazing, you know, in the workplace, what are, Mm. what are some of your thoughts, some ways that companies, uh, leaders, executive leaders can just be mindful of that. So Mm. they're opening up, you know, clear lines of communication along each, Mm. each of those generations. I think just ask them what they think works, you know, just say, look, yes. Um, (laughs) where I come from, this is what I've, and it can go both ways, right? Because the junior people really need to also learn how the leaders communicate. They mustn't come in. And I think some young people do. I'm talking from an Australian context, particularly um, come in with the assumption because school was created this way, all of the child centered learning approach, which came out in the mid eighties, you've got pretty much every teacher now has been dipped in that methodology, everything's Mm. about the child rather than everything's about the teacher. So they've grown up with an education system that sets them up to think, well, this is actually, I'm really important and this is a fair bit about me here. When I think that when it gets out of balance is a bit of a problem. Mm. So I think we've got very different generational perspectives. You're right about roles and responsibilities and who should do what and who should step up how and and all of that. So I think the only way to get around it is to say, I'm really excited you're here with us on this team and I'd really love us to work together really well. I'm really thrilled about what we've got to do together. Um, I'd like to share with you how I like to communicate and what really matters to me and I'd like you to do the same. Wow. Tell me what matters to you, right? And let's not shy away from the idea that this is a two-way street you know i think leaders have the right actually to say look i'm frightfully busy there are some things you can do that will really really help me here and actually i don't mind if you're a boomer or you're an alpha (laughs) i just want you to do a few things for me and i will respect you and your needs as well but i I think it's got to be two-way and i think leaders have the right to ask for what they need boy that's so good what um what, what advice would you give to executives who uh, they've kind of fallen into some communication traps and they've gotten into some bad habits and you know the lack of clarity has been missing and nobody on their team is really pointing it out so they're just kind of keep rolling through and mm-hmm. you know finally it, they're starting to feel some of those cracks that wait a minute mm-hmm. something's you know something's not right uh, what what's what's some of your thought wisdom advice you know to those leaders 
to kind of make those course corrections so they don't get too far off? I think the first thing is if they've got an inkling that something's not working to ask some people what it is that they think is not working. And so if they're getting some, maybe they're not getting their decisions through. Maybe they can see a colleague who's getting every paper they put forward. It's just, yep, go get that million dollars. You can have it off you go. And they're going, and instead they're getting, oh, you know what? I've got some more questions for you. Can you go away and do another paper and answer these questions? And then let's talk again. So if, if maybe that's the sort of thing that's happening, I think they need to ask the people who are receiving their communication, yep. you know, I can see some things that, you know, I would have loved to have had that decision this time. Yeah. Could you just help me understand what I could have done differently to get that decision this time? But also ask the person that they, you know, their colleague, there's usually somebody around who's annoying and gets right. it done really quickly. Right. You know, ask that person or those people, can you tell me what you're, what are you doing? How are you making this happen? And, you know, it could be that they're having better conversations before they present to really understand the issue. It could be that they're, floating the boat you know they're they're using their influence skills to get the leadership group on board and understanding the problem and getting a feel for their recommendation before they present it could be those kinds of things or it could be just that they're not burying the main message on page 47 it could be all of those things right wow boy that's so powerful i mean it's just it's just listening to you it's just so apparent how uh communication needs to stay open it needs Mm -hmm. to stay clear and, you know, trust has to be developed so we can, you know, actually, you know, communicate with, you know, some of those things. What are, what are a few ways that executive leaders can continue to improve some of their communication skills? Because my contention is the, the more you work on improving your communication skills, uh, the more trust you build, the more, yeah. you know, the, the deeper your connections will be. Yeah. But I, I think sometimes it's like breathing. We take it for granted. We we breathe all day long, yes. you know, and I, I really take it for granted that I can do this. It's same thing with yes. communicating, you know, yes. I just take it for granted until there's this big giant blow up and I go, yes. what do I got to do to, you know, fix this? Yes. Yeah. I think, isn't that so in life with everything though, until there's a big crisis of some right. sort right. or suddenly something really matters to you, you don't get out of your own way to make a a substantial change because change is hard, right? Um, And I think there can be a bit of fear in it too, that some maybe we'll find out we can't do it, or maybe there's something that's just got to get to the core of us as a person that makes us feel bad. So there's all sorts of reasons why, why we don't. Um, But I've forgotten your question. Oh, just ways that Executive leaders can can continue working on, oh, yeah. you know, those issues. Are there things daily, weekly, you know, kind of keep yes. their mind on? Yeah. No, the thing that I encourage people to do is to focus on their first email of the day Ooh. and to spend that extra little bit of time on that first email. And the reason I do that is that it's, you know, if it's more than a line long, yes, go ahead. I mean, that doesn't count, you know a substantive one of five lines or more and just make sure it's really clear and make sure that you've got a main message that's really easy to find and that the subject line you've really thought about so that you just set yourself up for the day and I would actually suggest I'm talking email there which might show that I'm a Gen X that I use email (laughs) right and a lot of people now use these you know chatting tools like slack and teams and so on instead so I would say same same I don't think it matters what medium it is, but your first super short communication of the day, just sweat that, give it an extra five minutes. Think really carefully about what you want to achieve with it. Think really carefully about what the main message really is and who it's really for. And just do that to set yourself for the right tone for the day. Oh, I love that. I love that. Such uh, incredibly practical advice and Yet so, I mean, so important that we just can't miss. Uh, I, I just can't thank you enough for this conversation. You oh have brought pleasure. so many great uh, insights. And uh, I mean, I can just in, in speaking with you for this time, I can, I, I know exactly why companies are coming to you to help with their 
communication issues and, you know, appreciate you pouring that out. Uh, just a couple of rapid fire questions before mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I, we kind of move on, let you go. We're building this, uh, online community, uh, communication skills library. Mm -hmm. So all of our guests, we ask them these questions and we put all their best resources in there. But uh, when it, yes. when it comes to speakers, uh, do you mm -hmm. have a favorite speaker, someone that you, every single time you listen to them, they just fill up your cup, uh, and you can't wait to, you know, share that talk with someone else. You know, I was, I saw these questions before we, we spoke and I've been racking my brains and I don't, cause you know, I listen to podcasts. I listen to conversations I love it. I love much it. more than I listen to speeches. And so I don't know. I can't give you one. Truly. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah, I love that. I so let's, yeah. let's jump to the podcast. Who, mm -hmm. who's one or two that you, boy, they just either guilty pleasure or development. They just, mm. they fill your bucket and you can't wait to mm -hmm. send that episode on. There are lots and lots and lots. <laughs> so this one was hard to answer for a very different reason. Okay. <laughs> I love long form podcasts. Yes. And the one that I've come across most recently that I'm really enjoying is called Braver Angels. Mm. And we live in fairly um, polarizing times, actually. Yes. You know, politics is, is pretty interesting, you know. And what they do is that they will consciously have a red and a blue perspective. Maybe on a panel, they'll have a few of each. Maybe they'll have wow. two people on different sides of the same issue. And the rule is that there's respect and really great tone through everything. And the idea is that you have a great conversation. I love that. Oh, I love that. Mm. I, I, I love that. I mean, it is amazing how quickly friendships are ruined, uh, mm. re family relationships because of some of those polarizing issues. And but it comes back to communication and listening yes. again, doesn't it? And just saying, you know, we've always been such great friends. Can you tell me why you think that? And yep. in fact, even if you say, tell me why you think that, that can feel a little bit tense, but what is it that got you to that place? Or what is it that makes you think that? Yep. The what question's a bit softer, I think. Yes. Tell me, I'd love to know. I'm really interested. Oh, yeah. I love that. Those are so helpful. Is there a book that you recommend? Boy, every leader, you've got to read this. It's got to be on your shelf. Uh, you you, mm -hmm. you got to pass this on. Mm -hmm. It's called Making Time for Strategy. Oh. And it's by a fellow called Richard Medcalf. And I heard Richard speak on a podcast a few years ago now, and I approached him. And so I helped him with his podcast, actually. But his book, and when I speak to him also, it comes through, is that he will tip things completely on my head. Hmm. And I'll think, oh, that's just the normal way of doing those things. And he'll say, well, actually, if you thought about this backwards, you'd get a much better result. It's like, huh, I've never thought about it like that. Wow. That is so very, very true. And he's the one, you know, his title is Making Time for Strategy, but he's the one that's helped me really see that value of freeing up thinking time and how to do that, you know. And his number one strategy, or the one that I took away first, let's put it that way, was to focus on what you want to achieve and do the thing that you really want to do that you think is going to drive the most value first. Forget the other things. Don't start the day with your email. Don't start your day with all those things you have to do. Yep. Lock off time. Do the thing that you think is going to drive most value and lock the time away. Is it once a week? Is it once a day? Whatever rhythm works for you. But do that first. Focus on what you want to get to, what you need to deliver, the big thing. And do that wow. first. And let the rest catch up. Oh, I love that. I love that. And we'll make sure we put all of those in the show notes and in the Speak With People uh, community Facebook group. Let us know, where can we send our listeners to find you online? And what's the best place to do that? My website, I think, is the best place. It's clarityfirstprogram.com. And I've got lots of free things. I've got a 10-minute free email course. I've got other documents and, and tools for people that are completely free. And I've got a blog and, and so on. So there's lots of ideas that don't require any any money, just time, um, that you know are designed to really help you. So I'd really encourage you to go there and have a look. I love that. And we will be posting uh, links to your books 
uh, in the show notes and in our community group. And we'll put that in our email as well so we can point people to your resources because they are uh, absolutely fantastic. This time has been so rich. I feel like I could, I took a whole page notes. I feel like I could ask you about 20 more questions, uh, even selfishly for my business. I would love to start <laughs> asking you Feel some of questions, but I can't thank you enough. I, I'll be in uh, Seattle area, uh, middle of September speaking at a conference. And so oh, looking cool. forward to, uh, yeah, getting out to your, uh, your neck of the woods and how beautiful it is. But thank you again for being on the podcast and really appreciate you sharing your wisdom with our community. No, absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for joining us on another episode of the Speak With People podcast. We hope that you were encouraged. We hope that you were inspired and challenged to improve your communication skills. I want to thank you again for being a part of the Speak With People podcast community. Make sure you don't miss out on being a part of the Speak With People Facebook community group. Just head to Facebook, type in Speak With People, scroll down and join our community because every single day we're encouraging each other, we're helping each other to improve our communication skills. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next episode.